recording we're live and we will start all right so welcome to aim present strategies for success with pitch we're really honored to be here and to be part of this amazing event and today we're going to talk about how to set up your music business we're going to be talking to four experts who have very very different business models to demonstrate that there isn't just one way to set up your business and that as long as you imagine it, you can make it happen. Um, you can be as fluid as you want and you can create many different business models and still generate success. So before we get into it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Then I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panel. My name is Ben Winter. I work for AIM, the Association of Independent Music. We are a leading trade body within the music industry. We represent the independent sector, which makes up 26% of the music business in the UK, recorded music business in the UK. Um, our role is to support anybody that's independent from the, the self-releasing artists in their bedroom to the largest independent record labels in every area of the business from um, distribution, from how to find a radio plug or all the way through to governmental policy and influencing different policies within government level to ensure that the independent sector is taken into account when decisions are being made. So if you'd like to know more about AIM, please feel free to drop me a line at ben at aim.org.uk. That's ben at aim.org.uk. Or you can hit me in my DMs on Billionaire Ben on any of my socials and we can connect that way. So that's me. I'm also founder of Power Up, an amazing an initiative to push back against anti-Black racism. And I also have my own music business where I have a management company, production company, and record label. I will introduce you to our amazing panel. And I'm going to start with how I see everybody on, this, on the screen. So I'm going to ask Mobo to introduce himself and to let us know a little bit about who you are and your company and what you do. Hey, uh, my name is Mobo Agoro. Um, I'm based in Glasgow, Scotland. I'm an artist manager, run an artist management company called Forage, which works at the intersection of music and culture, building teams around artists in order to help them execute their vision. Currently on our roster, we've got two artists, singer-songwriters, and um, two producers uh, who have got releases coming out right now, which I'm excited for. Excellent. Thank you, Movo. Talia, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Talia. Um, I am an artist and DJ based in Glasgow, um, and I make electronic music. That's kind of it, really. Excellent, thank you. Deneo? Okay, so my name's Deneo. I'm a producer, songwriter, artist. I've had like about 22, just over 20 year career. Um, I generally make black music and electronic dance music together. I also run a few businesses I've got um, a record label, which I'm currently putting a lot of effort into at the moment. I have a publishing company and I have a property business. So, yeah. Excellent. And last, but by no means least, Stella. Hi, Ben. Um, yeah, I'm Stella, Stella Reed. Um, and I co-founded Rough Bones, which is a talent development hub with management and label services uh, to help empower young, young independent artists. I also uh, co-chair AIM Small Label Committee, um, so very in touch with startups and uh, the independent uh, sector of the industry. And then I also sit on the AIM board, so uh, delighted to be here. Great stuff. Thank you. So we're going to get straight into this. Um, so with that said, you all manage rights, 
but are set up in different ways. Can you tell me a bit about your business setup and how that works? And we'll start with Mobo. In regards, sorry, sorry to cut you, when you say your business start and how it works, what do you want to know specifically? Because that's a big, wide question. So specifically what your company is or looks like. So for example, you're a label. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what that looks like for you, how you set that up. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with Mobo. Yeah, um, so I run a music management company. Um, the main aim is helping to develop artists to a point where they can proficiently create music and have all the tools around them in order to do that and also build my fan base around them. The way that we got set up, I actually started while I was still in uni, started a creative collective just of like-minded people, figuring out ways that we can plug the gaps that we felt were missing. Um, that started by Pitman events at the at Glasgow School of Art, which eventually led into me supporting artists on a longer scale, on a wider scale. Um, and when it comes to the development, it's really about building teams around the artists, which means for, in my case, which means finding the right producer for the artist to work with, finding the right, um, finding the right collaborators to work with, helping them understand what their message is and how they want to be also perceived by the public. And that process is a process I enjoy, but it's a long-term process as well. Um, one of the acts that we're launching called Thousand Dollar Wallet. He's been under development with with me for two years now. Just getting getting the music right and also the vision for him right. And what I've mainly learned over that time period is really patience, like being patient with not only where you want to go, but also being patient with the artist as well and um, balancing balancing expectations mainly okay thank you for that um stella i'm gonna ask you the same question yes uh our setup so how do we get started i suppose rough bones is the one that's relevant here so um i started out in music ages ago as a as an artist songwriter producer and uh I guess I've told this story in a few panels before where I was constantly told, no, you can't do it this way. No, you got to do it that way. Uh, um, and finding sort of a, a lack of creative expression from creating to releasing the music that I was creating. And I thought there had to be a better way to set this up. Um, so I took matter into my own hands and uh, found a few like-minded people. And that's how Rough Bones was born. Um, we started as a talent development hub. So working with artists who knew they had the passion for creating music, had the talent, needed a little bit of support, uh, refining certain elements of the talent, uh, understanding different elements of the music business, um, working with them over a period of time. And what we saw is with guiding the creativity process, we fell into uh, the release side of it as well, managing rights, acquiring rights and managing rights with the artist and for the artist. Um, and over a short number of years, which is a very quick learning curve if you're a uh, steep learning curve, rather if you're an independent, uh, we, we sort of wore management hats, uh, publishing hat, uh, label, independent label hat and yeah, so at the moment we sort of offer a 360 type service depending on the artist's needs. Um, and that's kind of our setup. We're a small, small niche um, uh, behind the scenes, but, but we like to, to work with a, a wide variety of artists from uh, pop, commercial pop, to indie pop, to hip hop, uh, rap, um, and EDM, electronic dance music. So that's us. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna come back to you on something you said there, but I'm gonna come back to you shortly. Sure. Um, Talia, your setup's slightly different to the two that we've heard before. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> can you explain the way that you work? Um, well, I guess, well, first and foremost, I'm an artist. And so whether 
I always had a very um, particular artistic vision and I guess it was just trying to get um, the means to develop that and nurture that into perhaps what I have already. Um, I'm with of a small independent label based in London called Untitled Rex. And I met my manager around the end of 2019. He like found me on Instagram. Um, and then we just started a case of development there. He also runs the label that I'm with as well. Um, and then I guess it was just, I was already DJing at the time. I was just, I just started making music. Um, and then we were just like waiting for it, all that to come together. And then I got signed kind of during the first lockdown. And then through, I guess, me developing my career and becoming more successful or however you want to determine it, um, my team has just grew. Um, so I now have two booking agents, I have an assistant manager, um, I have a lawyer. I'm trying to think who, who, who else I have. I just have like a very big team. Um, but that, that that doesn't develop until like you get to a certain point. Um, but yeah, I was always very particular on what I wanted to do artistically. And um, I guess it's just getting to a point where that can become a reality. Um, and it's always that starting off point that is the hardest to kind of like overcome. But yeah. Okay, there's a couple of things I'm going to come back to you with you as well there. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Deneo, uh, so your journey has been a little bit different. It's led to you creating your, your own labels and business, your self-releasing, then you were major, you've been self-releasing, and recently you partnered with uh, uh, another independent label. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you've chosen to partner with another company and how your label setup works. So in regards to the, the record side of the label, it's really a development business. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find acts that I think are talented, that I think have potential to be stars. I want to develop them and release music while I'm developing them. And then hopefully... A, another company or a bigger company can come in and say, hey, we want to sign this kid or we want to sign that kid. So my my company, it kind of serves like three purposes. It, it, it serves the public. They get the music that they need to hear. They get to dance. They get to socialise. They get to feel good. Um, it also serves the artists. It gives young artists a platform to put their music out there and actually grow an understanding of how the music business works as well as how their music works. And then it also serves the record labels and the publishers because by the time the artist gets signed to them, the artist will be prepared to write two, three, four, five hits rather than the one hit that's on TikTok. They'll understand why that song's doing well. We would have written loads of songs like that and they would have been prepared. They would have had lawyers sorted for them. We would have tried to find managers for them. And so by the time they get to the label, they're already a good product. They can negotiate a deal, but then the label gets to work with them long-term rather than it be in the kind of one hit. That's a real popular trend at the moment. That's that aspect of my business. So you're almost creating a, a feeder system. Basically, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to be off. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to make my business more about being in service to others, rather than it being about me, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, to to totally understand that. Um, I'm just going to touch on something that Stella said. You said you started with uh, like-minded individuals, you found some like-minded individuals and then you created your company. How did you go about finding those like-minded individuals? How do you come across people that share your vision and want to, want to work to create something new and build that? That's a good question. Um, great question. A great question. Yes. I think with being in the industry so long, uh, I started when I was 16. So you get to work in different aspects of the industry from an artist's perspective and I think that's sort of why my lane 
uh, is unique in, in a way. Um, from working with different people, seeing how they worked, being in the industry really, mingling, um, doing project, different projects over time with the same people, you get a sense for people's way of working, their ethics, their principles. And I think that's very important when you're starting your company and selecting your team. Um, you have to make sure you have a real sense of the values of the individuals you're working with, because uh, that will reflect on the whole business conduct, the way artists are treated, the way business is treated. Um, you have to make sure that everyone is, is operating with the same long-term vision, short-term vision to avoid glitches down the line. Um, so I was really fortunate. I, I found uh, two really, really people who became good friends eventually, um, but two people who I'd worked in projects, other projects with time and time again, who were also at the point of starting a company. They wanted the same things. Um, so things fell together like that. But I, my advice for people who are looking to start their company is to find like-minded people, be very transparent with the kind of company you want to set up. Be transparent with uh, how long you will, your end goal. Um, make sure your differences are aired right at the beginning, as well as the similarities of your vision. Um, and I think it's important for compromise, but where you have core values of how you want to run business, uh, you know, you have to make sure that the things that you cannot compromise on are, are, are sort of laid bare from the get go to avoid uh, problems at the beginning. So I think uh, going back to your question, um, you need to just get into the industry, uh, work with people. A lot of these connections start out in studios, um, writing sessions, um, management conventions. You just need to get a sense of someone over time uh, without sort of repeating that point. Um, and yeah, that's it. I hope I answered your question. I didn't go on a conference route. No, you did. It was, it was it was very useful. I think the keys there were, were, were values and you know transparency. Those were definitely very 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 important. I found that anyway in times when mm -hmm. when we didn't share the same values. Go ahead, Mogo. Um, just to jump in on that point in regards to the values, um, I fully agree. And uh, just to make a little bit more sense of this to um, some young people that might be listening, if you're maybe an artist, a rapper, let's say, um, when we're talking about business, you're a business yourself as well. And when it comes to looking for the right people um, to work with in regards to airing out, um, figuring out your shared values, figuring out your disagreements, I think that's also important at that stage already so that you can get used to it once it gets to a point where you're working with a bigger company and you can figure out your system, your mechanism, as well so i think that really relates on a bigger scale but also at a very entry level um and i i, I fully agree thanks for that mobo um and actually i'm going to come to talia because it kind of ties into what you were saying about um about how you met your manager and mm -hmm. how that tied into label and i was really interested to understand one how you are able to connect with your manager when you know obviously you're based in Scotland, manager's based in London, uh -huh. and how that connectivity happened. Um, it, it's very, it's very much like one of those stories that you like, one of those like ephemeral stories that you hear. Basically, I played like a show, um, and someone put a, an Instagram video of me, and he saw the Instagram video, and then he got in touch with me, um, and then our relationship just built from there. And I think that. I had had a few other people interested, but I think with Alex, who is my manager, um, there was just this kind of care and consideration for what I was doing and what perhaps could come about of it, because I never intended on having a music career at all. I went to art school um, to do painting, so I very much fell into this, um, and I needed guided uh, and I needed to make sense of it all because I had no idea what was going on. Didn't know what any of like the music terminology or jargon was. Didn't know anything about like deals or contracts and stuff. 
Um, and I guess through working with him and working with Untitled and their team building and then my team building very organically, we've been able to create this real um, moment that I think is going really, really well. Um, and my team has grew a lot. Like I said before, I have like my manager, assistant manager, two booking agents. I now have a publisher. And then with that, there's like the label side of it. So like there's like sync and like all those kind of all those kind of things. And um yeah, it's just it's so it's difficult because I guess I didn't have like an intention on like trying to find anything or whatever. It very much just fell into my lap. And I was like very, I'm very lucky in that it was like a really, really great person who fell into my lap as well. And so um yeah but is it but there's also obviously like hard work that goes into it like I was still making music in that time and like I was still like making like good music and making sure that what I wanted to say was coming across well um I think that I I've always just been like a very good artist whether that's whatever medium I'm working in whether that's like visual art or performance or music I've always been quite sure of myself um and I think people can see that and it creates like a magnetism that I guess it draws the right people in I suppose yeah and what what, what was it that made you feel that Alex would be the right fit for you because you mentioned that there were other people that would that were reaching out and talking to you what was it um, did you gravitate towards Alex and say okay you're a good fit for me well I guess he who's very he very much cared about what was happening and what the future could be it was more of a it was more the fact that he was willing to develop my career rather than just like put out an EP and like have that be that we very much like wanted something more substantial um and I think so somehow we touched on the topic of TikTok and stuff like that he very much does like I'm very much someone who as I will do what I'm comfortable doing and like that's it and I have been well, perhaps with other labels or with other people there would be more of a pressure to go with the times and to go with like stuff that's happening on TikTok and stuff like that and he's very much never forced me to do anything that I didn't necessarily want to do I've always had full creative control over my career um, and that's something that I very much valued um so it was, it, was pro it was probably that more or less. It was more the fact that I know that I would have been able to do exactly what I want. And I am a consumer as well. Like I listen to music. I have my favorite artists. I know what is going on within like the musical zeitgeist. And I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew that it would be successful. And I have been able to do that. And it was successful. So, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Deneo, um, obviously, you know, you've had a had a pretty successful career thus far, um, spanning a couple of decades now. Time flies. In the early days, kind of being around that and 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 seeing what you were doing, I noticed that again, you made sure you had people around that that could serve what you were doing as well um like sort of reggie's and the dj turks and so on and so forth how how did you go about engaging people that you felt would help to elevate what you were doing or tap into what you were doing and how has that changed over a period of time to now where you're very focused on the label and uplifting the next generation of talent so i would sometimes find the mentors and sometimes the mentors would find me. So Sticky and Jason were my first mentors. I went looking for them because Sticky was on a radio station. I went there, I auditioned for him. It was very much uh, intentional. Reggie came to me kind of thing. So I think you have to be, you have to be able to accept blessings, but you also have to be able to go for your blessing one um i think the mistake i made will probably be will better answer this question me i i always used to i see the best in everyone 
I, I can't help it. I've always got everyone's best intentions at heart. So when I used to hire people to work for me or with me, I wouldn't actually look at what they had done in the sector they were approaching me to work in. I would just look at them, look at their work directly and be like, I think you've got potential to be da 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 without actually looking at your history and seeing, have you actually been growing within that? And that's kind of bitten me in the ass more times than, than not. Because what, what ends up happening is you hire someone who's not really qualified for the job, but then you pay them a lot of money. Now they're addicted to money. So then they become quiet. You end up losing money. You don't grow. So now I make sure I do my due diligence. I make sure that like, if I have a meeting with a, a, ma a, a major record label or an independent record label or a manager, to me, it's a job interview for them. To me, and even that kind of mentality lets me know, do you even respect me enough for me to challenge you like this? Because I've been in meetings with managers and they're like, I can see in their face, they're like, who are you talking to? Like, why are you? And in my head, I'm thinking, you're going to be managing my life. I don't know that you're capable of it. I need references. I need da 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 da, da. I'm not just going to take your word on it because you've got Adele. Like, I don't know how you got Adele. Is, it, was it an accident and you just actually happened to manage it or did you build it from point A to point B? I need, uh, do you know what I mean? So I think now I try and treat the people I work with as like an employer looking and interviewing employees. And then once the interview's done, I make the decision, does this person work for me? Do I work for this person? Is this a partnership? And do they have not only the skills, but the expertise to execute what they say they can execute. And I think that's, that's really important. And I learned that from trial and error. And I also learned that from things like this and speaking to people that have been successful um, running businesses. And I'm not ashamed to say I know nothing. I'm not ashamed to say I'm ignorant to things. And I think that, that's helped out a lot as well. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. How did you get to that place where, I, I, there's a couple things I'm gonna ask you. How do you get to that place where you were able to overcome, um, uh, you know, the, the, the feeling that, you know, I don't wanna look silly because I don't know X, Y, Z, where you can just be upfront say, I don't know that. How did you overcome that? Because I think that's a big barrier for a lot of people, especially in this business where there's a fear to say, I don't know. I've always been quite confrontational, to be honest. And confrontation isn't a bad thing. I've always been someone that will question something. But then I always, I've always been self-aware. So I always question myself as well, probably more than I should. So over time... Uh, I'd say the last five years, I've had to look at my career and actually say to myself, you're actually really capable of what you want to do. You've, you've achieved a lot of things and you're not going to get further until you have self-confidence in the skills that you have. Because like I always say, like if your house is burning down and a fireman comes to hose the house down, you don't want a, a man who's stumbling and whatnot. You want a man that knows what he's doing. He goes in, he puts the hose in, he fires down, you want assertiveness. And if I don't learn to be assertive within myself, I don't benefit anyone. Because I'm gonna be umming and ahhing and second guessing myself. And as I'm hurting myself, I'm hurting people around me. So a lot of self-confidence came with that. And a lot of being close to God as well. Because at the end of the day, sometimes you don't have the answers. Now I know everyone's not religious, now, but that's my thing. One, one of my biggest things is I'm very close to God and sometimes I will follow his rule and what his opinion of me is. And then I'll remember he thinks I'm capable. So I should think I'm capable, be capable and action it. So sometimes you just got to look at yourself in the mirror. And as sometimes when you look at yourself in the mirror and be like, oh, I look rubbish today. 
sometimes you've got to look in the mirror and be like, hey, man, I made my hair really well today. I cut my hair. Like, you've got to give yourself those things because people want efficient people and efficient people are people who are sure of themselves, are confident in themselves. Yeah, I always say it's important to know what you don't know and then you can get yeah. people around to fill in those, that void. So I, I can yeah. believe. No, but I mean, like, you need to, you need to, at some point, you need to attack the self-doubt. You need to confront it. You need to be like, am I, is, is what I'm doubting a doubt? Or am I just being insecure? And if I'm being insecure, get over it. Yeah, I totally hear you. And I'm just going to touch on one other thing that you said in terms of um, the, the, the interview process that you go through um, mm -hmm. with work people. Now that you're actually on the other side of, of the desk as well, um, mm -hmm. how do you how do you convey that to the young talent that you're working with that, you know, this is what I, I'm bringing to the table. This is my expertise. This is where, you know, all the things that you just mentioned, how are you conveying? I've kind of, I've kind of always been um, on the other side of the table, but that is a good question. I need to, I need to answer this. Um, I need to think about this. Hold on. So just to give you a backstory, my dad is a general from the army, right? And sometimes when you have a, a father who's a disciplinarian like that, sometimes you have no choice but to be a student and to, to shut up and listen. But most of the times when I've just accepted, you know what, I don't know, and I should shut up and listen, it's always worked for me. So when it comes to my artists, the first couple of sessions, there's no negotiations on this. You do what I say and you do how I say it. There is none because I need to know, do you respect me enough to let me lead you? Because remember the leadership thing is not about you're above someone. Everyone has plays their role. The student has to give the leader the respect and the patient to teach you. And then the, the, the teacher has to respect that, hey, this person is trusting me enough to do that. So that technique that I use, the kind of um, the dictatorship situation is more about, can you follow orders, right? If we, can you, can you, cause right now in this situation, I'm the one with the expertise. Are you gonna get in your own way and not learn these things or are you? If they pass that, then it becomes a democracy. And usually it's just one session. It shouldn't take more than one session. One session, I'll be like, here's the beat, here's the melody, you write the lyrics. If you don't, it, I, I don't, I'm not even fussed if you don't like the beat. Can you take orders? Once it's that, then it becomes a democracy. And then I know that, okay, this person trusts me enough for me to lead them. Now I need to soften because at the end of the day, no one likes a a draconian dictator do you understand what i'm saying but now i feel comfortable that if i say hey we need to form do a formation and we need to move forward this way it's going to happen like say for instance one of the things i tell my artists is you're allowed to sign to someone else that's what all this is for i'm here to advise you if i advise you to do something and you decide to do it i'm not telling you not to do it but what I, I'm not going to tolerate is you not talking to me about it first and saying, hey, Deneo, I agree what you're saying, right? But for these reasons, I want to do this. Because at the end of the day, there still needs to be respect there. And you don't know, as, lo as much as you're walking into something, it lets me know I can walk into this situation with you because at least you have my best interests at heart. And I think teamwork, and, uh, teamwork is a big part of success. But you, you've got to kind of test your team to see if they are going to work with you and if they respect you. And I think respect's really important. So when it was, so like I said, with the art, like with, um, with managers and stuff like that, it's a different scenario, but with artists, it's very much, it's very strict, the first session. And then after that, once I've assessed you, then it becomes, how do we work together? And actually, how do I serve you as an artist? So my, again, my artists also, we have, a, we, have, um, we have open communication. So my artists can call me at any time and be like, hey, 
uh, I'm going through an issue. Like, for instance, I've got an artist and she organised and promoted her own concert and was able to get 150 tickets and on top of that, 50 guest lists. But she's called me and said, like, I'm not really sure about myself. Like, am I doing more? Am I not doing enough? And my job is to say, uh, let's slow down. Last week, you sold 150 tickets on your own. Do you know what I mean? You are clearly capable of that. If you can look at that, you're going to grow. If you don't look and acknowledge all the good things you do, you're never going to grow. So it, I, I like to open up a, a kind of mentorship, a kind of level, because these, these kids are young. They don't know. They, they don't even know that they're really good at some things most of the time. Because everyone in the music industry is, is trying to exploit them and trying to take and control it's like yeah but the person who you're trying to control needs to be efficient in delivering what they said they can deliver which is make music and make sound decisions when it comes to business and stuff like that does that answer your question totally totally and and i love the fact that um there's, there's an element of mentorship in there there's an element of discipline there and it's you know this is why we're having this conversation because it's a different model. That's a unique model. Yeah. And it's a model that works for you and would work for other people. But it, that's why we're having this dialogue to recognize the, the different ways of, of doing things. And I think it ties in nicely to Talia and, you know, the way that you mentioned your team and, and how that's expanded over time. Um, from just management and label to now having a couple of agents, both for live and for, for DJing as well as publishing. Um, can you expand on the kind of time frames that that happened and the way in which that happens? I know some of the people watching oh, God. might sit and kind of go, okay, I need to get a manager and, and a publisher, um, I need a couple of agents. Can you expand, just explain like the journey towards building that team? Right, that is a good question because I'm really bad with timing. So I don't think I had a manager. No, I, well, I've had a manager my full career, but I haven't, I didn't have agents until perhaps the end of summer last year, maybe, or during summer is when... Um, I got signed to primary um, and so yeah that just kind of like built from that and um, we my my manager was just kind of like shopping around for different agents because it got to a point where like right we need to get like an agent like we need to get something going here um, and I think primary had gotten in contact with him um, don't quote me on it and then we set up a meeting with um, Marsha and Sally, who are now my two agents. And I think that just like the vision aligned and um, what we all wanted out of it co coexisted with each other. And um, it that just kind of happened from there. And through that, um, I've gotten really, really great shows. Um, I've done like a really kind of like extensive summer tour already. Um, and that'll finish around I'm kind of booked up up until like the end of August and then I have like a bit of quiet time in September and then I'm like kind of like back into it in October um, and then with I guess with publishing it's kind of it's not um, that just kind of I don't really know in the sense that well to me it just kind of came to us but I also don't really know the work that Alex does in the background like he works very very hard but he doesn't bring things to my table until they're like for sure um so yeah I'm trying I had like something else that I wanted to touch on but I don't know I can't remember what it was make, make, make a note and when you're ready just Jump in. If you have any other questions, like, <laughs> like, like, please, please, like, guide me because I guess I get I stumble on my words a little bit. No, um, but fine. Um, from yeah, from the artist perspective, I think that 
in terms of trying to be successful, I've always knew the demographic, at least of the people that I wanted to connect with in my music. Um, and I think having that knowledge already guided me in what I wanted to do in terms of like live shows or like merch, for example, or how I wanted like my release schedule to be or like what I even wanted to release during this time because I released my EP and that kind of like blew up. And then I had, I have this like time now, I'm currently in the process of writing my album, but I also want to remain within like the zeitgeist and still show, um, I guess, production and music making techniques that I want to show up until that point. Um, because I spoke, I remember just after Angelica came out, I spoke to Alex and I was like, is there any chance that I can like just go away for like two years and do my album? And he was like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, like okay. Um, so it's just trying to, it's also trying to mold yourself within like the times that we live in and like overconsumption and like people's attention spans are so short. And so it's still, still remaining true to yourself, but allowing people perhaps not to forget who you are in between like, making your project so doing whatever you want to do um yeah and by the sounds of things you and alex have an amazing relationship like how mm -hmm. have you managed to develop that over time because it sounds like there's there's you know a massive amount of trust there and again going back to mentorship that Danae was talking about there's a level of mentorship that's happening there as well how have yeah. you to, to develop that and you know especially in terms of um the geographic situation I think it's de it's developed quite well over time I mean me and Alex first met when I was living in Berlin and he was living in London so it was always a kind of like long distancey kind of relationship um but I guess we have both been in the Talia kind of thing from the beginning, like me and him. And so with everything that's happened, we've both been there to like support each other and to really see what's going on. And I guess when things go well, you can't like, you're just happy about it. And um, it's definitely been a really, really great fit. And I think that he's an, a complete asset to who I am as a person. And you need, you need to be able to trust the person that is like literally organizing your day-to-day -day life. And like, literally, but like he, I don't know where I'd be without Alex to be quite honest. Like I would be able to manage myself, but I wouldn't be able to do it very well. Um, so yeah, like with any relationship, it just gets better over time. And that's the only way that I can describe me and Alex's relationship. It's like, we were, obviously when we first met we were strangers and I knew previous work that he'd done and um, that he worked for like Polydor and all that kind of stuff um, but until you start actually working with the person the relationship doesn't fully develop and I understand the idea of like you need to understand like someone's credentials and things like that and that is very very true but on an interpersonal level you can't get to know someone until you're close to them, to be quite honest. And that's how our relationship has developed. And yeah, we both just want the best for each other. And obviously there is uh, an element of, he's been in the industry a lot longer than me, um, but there's like an equal partnership of just wanting to do well. Excellent, yeah can definitely um definitely sense the love in the relationship which is i think is really important um sure. mobo and stella coming from a more executive viewpoint i'm gonna ask you guys a question about money um it's all well and good that you're you know you're ready to go whether you're an artist whether you're you're setting up your label or your company and you're good to go how do you access finance? How do you access capital? How do you get yourself started so that you can put music out? Um, what What was the journey like for you guys? Who, whoever would like to go first, feel free. Go first. Um, 
just to kind of tie in something that Talia said there, just before I jump into the, the thing about finances, is uh, reinforcing the point that with the manager artist dynamic, because that's something I also do, is for those artists out there who are pre getting a manager before you make that decision, it's such a very close, intimate dynamic that I think it's important you don't rush into it. You make sure you take time to get to know the person because it, like Talia was saying, you could it could either enhance your career or 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 be a very difficult way to navigate the industry. Not not in a in a, a, a doom and gloom kind of way. What I'm getting at is if your dynamic with your manager is is solid, that will give you the level of support that you need, the level of insight that you need, the level of, you'll have a partner in crime for lack of a better word. I think it's just one of the most valuable uh, relationships that you, you can have or you can build um, because in the manager, you'll find your mentor, you'll find someone to bounce off uh, uh, things, issues that you don't understand uh, hopefully someone who understands the industry, who's been there, who's worn multiple hats of different elements of the industry, because these days as a manager, you, you nearly do everything. Um, and they'll be able to navigate it and guide you. Um, and another important thing about that dynamic is the freedom that you should be able to have as an artist. Um, you don't want to just be impressed by accolades, because I know some young artists are, they're like, oh, you signed ABCD, um, or you've done ABC and all that. Um, but I think you should have the courage to say, to ask those questions like Danae was saying, um, whether forthright or even to yourself, what, what, how interested are you in my music? Where do you see me going? Are you, are you open to hearing where I wanna go? Are you open to allowing me to dialogue and dream out loud? Are you gonna support it? Are you gonna be a cheerleader? Your manager should be your biggest cheerleader. Um, uh, and I think that's just an important thing to stress. And, and, and another nugget to add to that is people are really approachable, okay? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, it ties in that question you asked Ben about being able to say, I don't know when you don't have the answers. There are, there are answers out there everywhere from Google to uh, independent bodies like AIM, the AIM Associate. Um, there's just inf a wealth of information out there. If you're not as tech savvy, um, another way to access information is in your local communities, like uh, your local creative uh, music communities. Every, every town or every city has them. Um, don't be afraid to approach people like at your local radio stations, like Deneo said, uh, local studios, people are approachable. You just have to, to ask. Don't be shy to ask. Um, you'll be surprised at how willing people are to, to share their, their stories and their information with you. And then jumping on that, uh, that, that train then to, to tie in funding. I think this is an issue that particularly for uh, the, the independent artist for um, the minority communities funding is a huge issue. Um, and whereas, I, I mean, there's no, <laughs> there's no one answer that fits all. It's about number one, being very honest with yourself as to your starting point. Uh, most of the independent artists that we work with come with absolutely nothing, you know? Um, some of them putting in their whole livelihood into, in, into uh, putting projects together and getting it out there. First thing I would say is don't run yourself into financial ruin. Music is going to become a career for you. So you have to make sure that you have your job, that you are uh, you're able to do the basic things like your, you know, get your food, get your transport, put a roof over your head. Um, those are very important. Those, that's a given. That's the first thing. Um, and then in terms of actually, this is from, for an independent artist now, getting funds to access and make your music. Uh, sometimes studios will have 
hours that they allow independent artists to come in and do work uh, outside of peak hours. So you can ask your local studios for that. Um, there are also different bodies like um, PPL, AIM, uh, PRS, these, these types of organizations that do have funding that you can apply for. So that's also important um, to be aware uh, what's out there and available to you. So um, as I was saying, that would be, that would give the independent artist a few ideas on how you could seek funding um, or even just connect with your, your, your local community uh, to access um, options for funding. And maybe I'll hand over to Mobo now in terms of uh, management setup and funding, funding um, options there. Yeah, for funding options, it's that there's actually quite a lot out there. Um, I think it's just the case of being honest with yourself and understanding what stage you're at before you go for certain funding. Um, when it comes to a lot of the times when it comes to the artists I'm working with, they'll have an idea and they want to work on a project and they want to either put out an EP or they want to work with this person and their mad job when it comes to the finance side is figuring out how to actually get that. What I've started doing since last year is leaning on our local community, such as Creative Scotland, and also a little bit wider, um, the youth music organization, and looking for funds that will enable the artists to explore a certain idea and apply, like literally apply and for funding. That's one route, that's through public funding. Um, bringing them finances has also been possible for one of the acts that I manage called Joel, who has got a publisher out in France and they've been amazing with placing his songs and placing his music and spreading that amongst their sub publishers um, recently landing us um, our first sync um, on a Netflix show, which was great. Um, the point I want to make with that is that like there's multiple ways as a musician in the end, your music is a product, whether you put it out as that or whether you hold on to it and then find a partner such as a publisher, you might want to take on that music and then start pitching it for things. Um, so like, yeah, I'll definitely recommend, don't quit your job until um, you, you, you've, you've figured that out, like a way to actually sustain yourself. Um, that was one of the mistakes I made early on. Um, and I found myself in a little bit of bother through that. But um, yeah, definitely, as I said, um, finding out like funding partners is definitely a route. And especially in Scotland, if you are um, working within any sort of rap or genres or even any other genres, um, I think you should, you should therefore apply for funding and apply for funding outside of Scotland because um, being part of the devolved nations, they, they do need to listen at the very least. Yeah, I think that's that's very key. If you're in a devolved nation, I think if you can apply, it actually, in many cases, will actually help the fact that you are from somewhere else because there's a lot of applicants coming from London. I know with public funding, that's something that is looked at and taken into account um, from my time working at PRS Foundation. So yeah, definitely apply. Danao, I saw you nodding your head when Mobo was talking about um, the mistake he made in quitting his job. Let me know your thoughts. Um, whenever artists ask me what's the first thing they should do when it comes to having a career, I always say get a job for two reasons. The first reason is more personable. If you're constantly worried about money, how are you going to get money to go on holiday with your mates? How are you going to take a girl or a guy out on a date? How are you going to go What cinema? How are you going to buy your new trainers? Every time you make music and every time you're creative, you're not being creative for creative sake. You're being creative because you're like, I need money. That's going to be the first thing. So if you have a job, it eliminates that worry about where your money's coming from. And when you go in the studio, it can just be about you and the music and your enjoyment, one. Two, in regards to having a job, it allows you to, especially if you're living at home with your parents, 
it allows you to save up the money and actually build up a budget for yourself to spend on your music, right? And that's really important because you might be making, I don't know, how, however much. You might have a six month plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you six months. I'm not gonna release anything. And within that six months, I'm gonna save this portion of my wage. And then I'm gonna use that portion to put into the music and promote it for the next six months after that. And then the third thing is, and this this one is this one. I've had to teach some of my uh, um, artists. It's a mentality thing. It, for me, if you have a job and someone offers you something, and it's 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 like a label offers you some money, but the deal isn't too great, you can always go back and be like, "Well, I don't need this money. I've got a I've got a job that sorts out everything." So. I don't actually need to take this bad deal. It may be, I might be making 30 grand a year and they're offering me 50, but are you, are you appreciating what you do with that 30K? That 30K might, you can go on holidays with that 30K, give your mum or dad money, uh, save some of that for your music. You've done all of that. And a lot of the time as musicians, we're so, we're so chasing for stability within making music. We don't look at what we have. And that goes back to, to the original thing about being confident. Sometimes you don't look at what you have, you look at what you want. And having a job helps you look at what you have better than not having one. I think it's the most important thing an artist should do, especially a young artist. If, you're, if you was like me, I wanted to make music since I was six years old. If I could go back in time, there's probably like two regrets in my life. The first one was, I knew I was gonna make music from six years old. I didn't do well at school because of it. I didn't even care. When teachers were like, you didn't do your homework. I didn't care, it was very, it was, my mind was already set. This is what I'm doing. Soon as I left and started my journey to adulthood and left secondary school, I should have got a job straight away. If I'd have gotten a job, I would have been able to keep that job all the way up until after Funky. I'd be a millionaire. Because when I was, when I went, the reason I made a lot of money in, in the UK funky situation, because I had a job the whole time. And I was able to manage my money. I was able to say, okay, this, this job is going to fund this, this business. Then once the business started making money, then it was like, okay, I can use all of my work money to survive and live off of, and I can save all of my business money. Then it turned into, I'm making three times the amount uh, with my music money than my work money. If I worked for a year, what could I say? It led me to buy a house. It led me to have freedom. If I'd have done that from 18 to 29 and I had a job that whole time, I would have had more money in the bank. So just to be clear, all the time you're having that success in, in the funky house era and you were I had two jobs. Name and you were working nine to fives. Yes, I was working at a car phone warehouse. Um, because remember, yeah, I've I've done the whole uh Popper was a Rolling Stone artist lifestyle. It's rubbish. I, I don't care what anyone has to say. It's not, it's not, it's rubbish. It's rubbish. Like I I I didn't go on holiday with my friends until I was 23, 24. They were going to Iron Apple from when they were 17. Do you understand? My friend had to teach me like, yo, bro, you need to get a job. Like my friends had to take me aside and they had to coach me and they were like, you need a job, bro. Like you can't keep living like this kind of thing. Because things go up and then they go down. But if you've got a job, when things go up, you can capitalize, save. When things go down, they don't bun you as much. So when I was, work when I was um, doing Funky, I got my car phone warehouse job because I know you can't get another job. You can't get the job you want if you don't have a job. Because the they, they're always going to ask you, like, where are you working now? Kind of thing. So I got the car phone warehouse job to kind of build the experience and whatnot. I smashed that job to pieces. And then I found a better job. And I did an interview for them. And I found the better job after Party Hard. So I was, I was making good money, but my mindset 
was still like, no, I need to stick at this job. I probably, I probably had a job for, for two thirds of that period. And it helped, it helped so much, so much. Because once you, like say for instance, like you're gonna put money into your business, your business is gonna at some point make money, right? Then you stop putting money into your business. Now your business pays for itself. Then your business starts making profit. Then you start saving. Then you start realizing, hey, that 25K that I make per year, 30K I make, I can spend all of that on myself because my business is making whatever. So now that 30K is, is spread more. It's not, as, it's not as if you have to kind of share it with this and share it with that. So as much as you're, you, you are thinking 25, 30K is not a lot of money, if you've got all of that to yourself, you live at your parents' house, you give them a little rent, you give it to the, the that's a lot of money for an 18-year-old, 18 to 25, especially if you're building a business. So I, I would say have a job. Now, it's not easy. I Again, I'm an army kid. I went nine to five, Monday to Friday. I would go to work, come home, go in the studio and I'd force myself to go in the studio. In that funky era, I probably made 700 records, maybe more within those two years, probably more. Then I would go to do three performances. Me and my friend would drive back to work, shower at the work and then work another eight hours. That's, that's a serious work effort. And I think I've been in situations looking after talent where they're like, oh, but I've got to quit my job now because I'm going in studio songwriting or I'm, we're going on tour and I'm always like, no, you should. Can I, can I, can I, can I um, talk on that? What you just said. Okay, so a big, another reason and a big reason I didn't get a job when I was a muse, when I was a younger musician was because I was always worried I'd miss out on opportunities. And when you're broke as a man, like to a point where your parents are cussing you out, it kind of puts things into perspective. And I said, you know, forget these opportunities. I need money. But what I realized while getting the job, and I hope you can hear this is, if an opportunity is for you, that opportunity will find its way to you. So for instance, if you're working nine to five and you, you're in the studio every evening, so you can't have meetings with record labels from Monday to Friday. If that A&R really wants to sign you, they'll meet you on Saturday. Furthermore, they'll meet you on Sunday. They'll take you out and they'll buy the food. You don't need to spend no money. If they really, if, they, if you really, really, really are not getting the job because of opportunities, then you don't understand how opportunities work. And the opportunities that are meant, there's nothing, nothing that can stop your destiny happening to you, nothing. That's my piece. I think I think that was very powerful. Um, does anybody have anything to add to that before we move on? Or want to add to that? Just one quick thing to to, to say that um, fantastic um, insight from Daniel. That was just brilliant. Um, the small money that you budget, like he was saying for yourself, for putting into your music, it's important to realize that. The, the the era of technology and digital that we live now you don't need to spend that much money making music if you make the music people will come to you um you, your prime your primary goal as an independent artist should be putting the music out so that people can hear it and come to you it shouldn't be about going to the meetings it shouldn't be about just get the music out the manager will find you like alex and talia the industry people will find you, like Daneo says. Once perfect your art, that's the main thing. Uh, get your head down, perfect your art, keep your day job going. Um, and, and in terms of, oh, I need money to make music, these days almost everything is digital. Um, connect with your local community, producers, songwriters, etc., outside of hours if you must. Um, and then if you, if you can't even do that, these days you have uh, services like Splice, where you can access, for young producers, you could access 
on a on a very cheap monthly fee. You have access to different sounds and um, you know things like sound better. You can you can you can connect with other musicians across the world to to do music with you. So there's an array of stuff online now that allows you to do good quality music um, without breaking the bank or or or, or cutting cutting yourself too thin financially spreading yourself too thin um i think there really is no excuse in, in this era because collaboration and community everything now that everything's digital it's it's easier for for industry people to discover artists in that sense um and it's also easier for you to put your music out put the music out people will come once you start generating that buzz people will come how do you generate the buzz get the music out it's kind of like a chicken and an egg situation. You just <laughs> got to do it. You've got to start and, and, and people will find you. They'll hear it and they'll come. Get it out. And there's so many platforms that you can I get think on for free and for cheap. Also, right, just right. to... Oh, God. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I was obviously a DJ before I started like actually making music. And, within, and being able to do that meant that I was able to generate and come in to generate money. Um, that didn't necessarily go towards my music, like it went to like me like staying alive. But I think if you are able to, if anyone who's working within electronic music or even just like rap, like to a great example within Scotland, Bems, Bems does DJ sets. Like in order to be able to, you need to come up with other facets and avenues of generating income because music it, like purely just your music will not make you enough money to survive that's a that's literally just the tea like it won't so you need to like because like you need to come up with like different merch ideas or like different things that perhaps will be able to subsidize what you do because obviously having having a job um can be crucial but when you get to i know that i just got to a point where there was no way that i could like function having a job and then also working on my career so if you are going to take the leap and quit your job you need to make sure that you have enough avenues that you're able to sustain yourself and sus sustain yourself in a way that um you're not just scraping by like you're actually living within the means that like you're comfortable and proud to be living in that's it that's another another great point and at that point, I think we're going to wrap this up. And just before we do, I think I'm going to come around to each of you and just, just ask you for two key tips um, to consider when setting up your business. And you've already given us many, and it can be one of the same things that you've said already, but just in a very succinct way. But um, if you had to give our audience two key tips when setting up their business and and considering their careers moving forward, what would those two tips be? And we'll start with you, Mobo. We haven't heard from you. Um, the main one, I guess, would be not to be scared to get it wrong. Um, don't be scared to get it wrong, because if you do get it wrong, someone will guide you in the right direction and will, it opens up an opportunity for you to learn more. And the second one would definitely be don't stop learning. Um, I'm not from a music I didn't start within music and that drove me to try and learn as much as possible. Don't, don't, don't stop learning. Don't be scared to reach out to people as well. That would be like the two key tips. Excellent. I think they're really good tips. Thanks for that. Um, Stella. Uh, the two tips I would give. First one will be be honest with yourself. Be honest what level you're at. Um, be honest about the practical side of living while you're trying to get your music business, your independent company, your artist life going. Be very honest with yourself. Um, don't expect to, I mean, it's important to dream as, as, uh, and that this is an industry that supports the, the, that mindset, but you also have to be practical um, on the other side of that with your day-to-day -day life. The second bit of advice is don't be afraid to ask questions. People are really approachable. Um, and that's something that I wish I had known 
even as a, a, a from when I first first got in the industry, um, there's never any question or dilemmas that you have that you can't ask. And if someone doesn't know in the industry, um, they can always point you to someone who does or resources where you can access information. Um, so those two things, as long as you're honest with yourself, uh, both in where you're at as an artist and with the relationships you get into as an artist uh, or even as a business owner, making sure that the other people that you're doing business with aligns with your own values, that's all part of the scope of honesty. Um, be, being true to yourself, I guess, is the cliche, but that is so true. <laughs> um, and then the second thing is, if you don't know, ask. Ask, 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 ask Google, ask everyone. Keep asking till you get the answer. Or till you get to, the, to someone who can point you in the right direction. Um, those are the two, the two things I would ask everyone to put in their survival kits for starting out. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in asking. I think one of my favorite words is why. Um, I, I use that heck of a lot. Why? But I don't understand why. <laughs> And I think it's really important to ask those questions. So yeah, I think those are two, two really good um, pieces of advice as well. Talia, coming to you. Um, I guess from the artist perspective, trust your creative vision because only you really know what you want to do and how you want to execute it. And um, you're gonna have so many additional voices within like your environment but as as long as you know who you are artistically then you can't really do any wrong and make sure that you work with people who understand you and understand perhaps what you've been through and what you want to offer to the world excellent again brilliant advice thank you and the narrow last word is with you um, the two things I would say is make sure you practice enough to be good at what you do, meaning you could be a genius. If you don't practice your genius, you'll never have the skill. You'll just have the mindset for it because that's all a genius is. It's just you, you, your mind understands things in a different way. But if you don't practice and you're not good at making music, you might as well just give that genius to someone else because you have to practice to be excellent at making music. So there's that. And in two, always try to be in service. Always try to be in service. Like when I make music, the reason I've made so many different genres is because like I can tell what the public want kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. At the end of the day, like if you make it about yourself, there's only so much you can go. If people feel like, they can come to you for answers or solutions to their questions, you'll get more fans and, and more support. So always try and be in service. I, I love that. I love that. That's, um, that's one of my favorite phrases. I use that a lot. Um, I say in the music industry, if you're a label, our job is to service the record. If you're a manager, your job is to service the talent. Your producer, your job is to service the song and the audience. Mm. Like we're in a service industry, in my opinion. And yeah, I think when people recognize that and say that, it gets me really excited. So thank you for <laughs> thank you for that. Um, thank you all actually so much for your time, for your words of wisdom, for your insights. I've learned a heck of a lot just listening to all of you speak and provide your thoughts. And I hope that the audience, you've all learned a lot from this as well. Um, please, 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 you know, follow everybody on their socials. Maybe, in fact, we'll go around very, very quickly so you can say your socials. Um, check out their music, check out their companies. And yeah, enjoy the rest of this amazing event that's been put on. Pitch is amazing. And uh, if you want to know more information about AIM, please feel free to drop me a line, ben at aim.org.uk or on my socials at Billionaire Ben. 
Um, and I'm more than happy to engage you and talk more about how AIM can help you get started in your music business, or if you already have your business up and running, how it can be a benefit to you. So please do get in touch. Very quickly, everybody just say your socials and how they can get in touch with you, starting with Talia. Go ahead. Um, at aka Talia on Instagram and then at Talia on everything else. And make sure you follow on Spotify. Yeah, Danao. and listen to the music. <laughs> <laughs> Daneo, go ahead. Uh, just follow me on Instagram, Daneo. My Twitter's Daneo as well, but mainly you can find me on Instagram. Daneo, D-O-N-A-E-O. Great stuff. Thank you. And Stella? Uh, it's at Rough Bones Music. All one word on all the social handles. So yeah, follow. Excellent. Great job. To find myself is at U-N-C-M-O underscore on Instagram. And forage.gla for the company. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, I'm sure everybody got a lot out of it and we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, Superman on the beat.